Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. Today I'm super happy to welcome back Mr. John Barclay for crafting your images with Topaz plugins. Hey John. Hello Nicole, good to be back. Yes, great to have you. So with that let me tell you a little bit more about John as you're looking at this beautiful photography. John is an award-winning freelance photographer based out of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He is also a very enthusiastic workshop leader and his workshops are very popular. I'll give you a link to that at the end of the session as well. He's also an inspirational speaker sharing his program Dream, Believe and Create to audiences all around the country. He was personally selected by DeWitt Jones to participate in his HealingImages.org project and his work has been published in a number of magazines and books. And it's also by, been used by many software companies, including ourselves, in our advertising campaigns. And re recently John was the recipient of an Excellence Award from B&W Magazine. And he's definitely a friend of Topaz, so I'm excited to have him back and I will go ahead and turn it over to him. Give me one second, John, and I'll flip you the screen here. Good. Well, thank you to my my friends at Topaz. I always enjoy these webinars, and, and I said to Nicole earlier today, as I wondered how many people would show up because I, it wasn't that long ago we were doing one of these. It seems like six weeks or so ago, and I was concerned it might be too soon, and then she told me, you know, over a thousand people had signed up. So thank you for coming back. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to know that you're not sick of me yet. Today, I, I thought what we would do, because of the new release of Detail 3, which is just great, crazy good, I think is what I told Nicole as I started to, to play with it. We're going to make sure that we spend a little bit of extra time on Detail 3 today because it really is good, and you're going to want to incorporate that into your workflow. But we'll also touch base on uh, Simplify 4 and remind you that that's relatively new. That was just before Detail came out. Of course, we should always touch on... Topaz Adjust because it's the heart of most, most of what the Topaz products do. Uh, so let's, let's just get started on this wonderful scene that we stumbled upon down in Cuba and, uh, and just talk about this interface a little bit here. So click here and we'll go into Topaz Detail. I'm working on some smaller JPEGs or even smaller PSDs just so things will go a little faster for us. So what we'll notice right away in the detail um, the panel is it, it should be a, a friendly environment that you are, it is now familiar to you with all of the, the plugins if you have the Topaz products. And on the left, there's even more um, presets. And so you can have them be very speci specific to the highlights or, or shadows or their smooth collections. So there's different collections and you can create your own. Um, and they work quite well, but those who have been with me before know that I like to be in the right side of the screen. And this is where we're going to notice some, some major uh, changes. Uh, if before, under the detail slider, or, or I should say the detail tab, um, these should be similar. We have the, the ability to adjust the small, medium, large details, and then to boost all three of those. But now if you'll notice up top here, we have the ability to affect the overall picture or just the shadows or just the highlights. And we can do those, by the way, independently. And as we go through a few different images here, you'll see where that makes sense. In the tone sliders, um, what, what the Topaz has done here is made them much more natural. You, you'll notice as we start to, to play with those one again on some of these images that the effect that is uh, wrought by the, the exposure or con or contrast is much more subtle and much more natural, and I think you're going to like that a lot. And then you have an effects mask, which is a big deal. So now we can use the wonderful engine of remask to help us to place that um, detail effect or the sharpening effect on a specific part of the image only. So let's get started. This is kind of an unusual situation where we're going to go to the bottom of the screen and in this de-blur, think about the de-blur at the bottom right side, here's where I am, uh, where you have basically two sliders, a de-blur size and a, a suppress the artifacts. 
basically, if, again, if we go up to the top of this, you have uh, small, medium, and large details. Well, think about the de-blur as even smaller details. But as Nicole and I have been chatting, it doesn't work on all images necessarily. It's really kind of, you think about it in an image that has a little bit of blur where you might use it. But in something like this, and again, I hope it translates on the screen over a webinar, if we just use this in caution, you need to use it ever so gently and carefully. I'm going to bring this up just a little bit in around 50-ish, 55 point, I should say 55. Leave the suppress artifacts where it is. And let me just do a before and after. I'm going to go kind of slow here so it gives a chance to see the screen. So there's before. We thought he was pretty sharp because I'm taking it with a prime lens, actually, this particular photograph. But let's hear the after. There's the after. So with the with at least my experience thus far is if we're doing some people photography, this de-blur as a first move, and by the way, it would be wise if wherever you're trying to use the de-blur capability that you use that first. Do that first, and then if you want to go now and work with some of the other sliders, feel free. So we can come back up here, and again, ever so gently, the tendency is to overdo it with these sliders doesn't take much and you can see that that starts to be overdone even at a, at a small level. So now let's do a before. Let's do an after. And we're starting to get some really, really great results in making things look extremely sharp, really sharp. Um, and again, this is because the engine has been completely rewritten. It's really from the ground up. As a matter of fact, if, you've, if you're a previous user and you upgraded, which again, great part about Topaz is upgrades are free, you will have gotten a little notice that says, hey, you're going to lose all your presets because it's a whole new uh, engine running, running this. And so it's much more refined and much greater control. And let's now talk about the tone slider. So if we wanted to change exposure, notice it's hardly even making an adjustment here. And I'm pushing it quite a ways already. So it's a, it's a very natural, it's not looking overly bright, but it is brightening up a little bit when you bring it down. Okay, pretty severe moves. You can see my uh, slider moving over to you know, halfway to the right, and it's still it's starting to look too bright. But it, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's, it's really a nice, subtle adjustment, uh, whereas before it was pretty heavy-handed. Same thing with contrast. Before, it didn't take much to start making it look overcooked, as I like to say. Now, it's doing a nice job of adding some contrast into that image. Highlights is going to do what we've always known to do is rain those highlights back in. Shadows can open up those shadows. White point, black point, those are pretty, pretty self-explanatory. But it's worth taking a minute just to review uh, these. And again, if you hover over things, it'll, it'll tell you what they're doing. What it's doing on these on these tone sliders is it's not really changing the color. Okay, I think a lot of people can look at those and say, "Why would I want to make something redder or bluer or magenta or cyan?" Um, well, it's really not doing that. What it's doing is it's affecting the brightness of those specific tonalities. So we have some control because sometimes when we're doing some contrast adjustments, we can affect the colors and this is a tool that allows you to bring some of that back so notice here in the cyan red it's just darkening or lightening that red tonality in the magenta green there's not that much of it here but again it's just darkening or lightening so they are really even though there's colors there to help you understand what colors are being affected recognize that it's really just affecting the brightness Right, uh, the, maybe even the luminosity you might think of of those particular tones, giving you further control. And then in the color uh, tab, uh, it is those are pretty much as we would expect them. The temperature slider you can think about that as a uh, white balance slider if you want to. So you could make it a little warmer if you wanted to, or a little cooler. And again. The, the subtlety of these sliders is a lot better. The tint, again, these would be very similar to in your raw processing that you might see in the saturation. Now, here's what, so you want to do all that, by the way, before you do any effect masking here that we're going to introduce you to. The reason you want to do that is in case you want uh, 
to have some tone control or adjustments, you want to get all that done, even though it might be affecting the whole image. And I do this a lot, by the way, as a, in the crafting thoughts here. I'm looking really just at this man and what's going on in this area. I don't want a lot of this detail enhancement or exposure adjustments to be happening in the background. I want that to remain somewhat soft so our attention stays on this man. And sharpness helps us to stay there. Softness in the background will help us to, to, to again, focus more on him. So this is where the great enhancement of having a mask. And we'll go through, and I've done, just to review now, I've done a little bit of the de-blur. I've come up and done just a little bit of small details. And, and just maybe I'll take a minute here and finish on, on the details. Let's, I'm going to move this artificially too high. Notice what it does. It gets really overdone. We're on the small detail. I want to show you the difference here. I'm going to do that. Push the, the medium detail the same way. Notice his face doesn't get overdone on the medium detail slider. I'm trying to give you an idea here of what's happening with the small, medium, and large details. I'm going to go down to the large detail slider and pull it way over. Right? All of these are, by the way, are other good choices. This is another look you might like in combination with the de-blur and just enhancing the large details. Let me bring that back down again. Right? It gives a slightly different look, a more stylized look. But in this case, I really want it to be a naturally sharp, so I'm just going to go up just a little bit in the small details. I'm sure there's some of you out there saying, what, what about the, um, the boost? I rarely use them as what I'll, as my response will be in my type of image processing. They're really there to do just that, boost each of these small, medium, and large details. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what the, why there are the small, medium, and large, because they really do affect things differently. If we were looking at the man's face, you'll see that it's dramatically different on each one of those. Uh, you know, whereas, again, the small one really brings out all those details, the smaller details in his face, uh, and we can overdo it pretty quickly. Medium being pushed up to that same level really didn't do that. It was affecting different sizes of details. Okay, so let's, let's say we like that really don't need to do much to the exposure. Maybe open that up a little bit, add just a tad bit more contrast. We're good to go, but again, I said I didn't want this to affect the whole image. I really wanted it to be just on his face. Well, let's go into the effects mask now. So I click on that tab, and now I'm given some sliders here. So what do they do? The strength all the way to the left is going to remove all of that in the background. It's basically going to paint black in this mask. If I move the strength slider all the way to the right, it's going to essentially paint white in that mask. The brush size is pretty self-explanatory. It'll make that reasonably big in this case. The hardness of that brush, it's just be the, the difference between the middle circle and the outer circle there. It's, it's the feathering of that brush, whether we want a nice hard edge brush or we want a more feathered brush. We'll leave that about there. The flow has to do with how much flow, and the edge aware is, again, remember this is using remask, ability to, to detect the edges of things, and this is going to help us to very quickly paint the mask without painting on the man, but painting out that area. So I've got my strength to the left, so we'll start painting with black, and it's contingent upon where that the crosshair is. So I'm just using, even though the circle is overlapping onto him, like right now, I am going to paint where the X is, where the crosshair is, and keep painting that. And now what you'll see by way of the masks, it's removing the effects that we've done. So it's removing the detail enhancement, it's removing the uh, tone enhancement and so forth, and just allowing that to happen on him. Now I can be, I haven't gone over this firmly enough, you can see in the mask that there's still some areas. We're, again, as I tend to say in these webinars, we're not trying to make perfect pictures in a webinar, we're trying to give some techniques that you can then employ in your own images. If you feel like that bled over onto him, well, no problem, just pull the strength slider all the way over here and now go back in and paint on him, and now that's going to bring that sharpness back and make sure that the, the adjustments that we did are being shown through. If we need to paint black again, just bring it over here and paint in these areas. 
products that are being uh, that are still showing up in your mask over here. So the mask is a good guide to help you understand what's happening and where you might need to paint. So now let's look at the before and after. Before, after. I'm looking at a couple places right now. It's easy to look on his face and see the differences, right? Before, all that's being affected is him. Isn't that brilliant? Great work by Topaz on this. Really allowing you to work on the sharpening or the, the enhancement of details in a very localized way. It's just tremendous. And you're going to start to see, I suspect, this capability throughout all their pieces of software. So there you go. A quick overview on detail. Detail 3, I should say. And again, if you, if you have previous versions, it's free to upgrade, do it right away. It doesn't cost anything. If you don't have detail at this point, it's great to have. Uh, if you don't have any of the Topaz products, the suite is the way to go because it includes a lot of what we'll talk about today, but we can touch on that a little bit later. So there we go. A um, little bit of work in detail and we've created a pretty spectacular looking image. Now. Just, just for fun, uh, you saw in the beginning, just to, to point out some other capabilities here, let's go back in really quickly. And we're going to do this probably on a few photographs here because I just think the black and white effects are such great little pieces uh, of software. I, can, I just went to the bottom right to reset all. When we reset all, it goes to the classic effect. And I just think it's brilliant how easy and simple it is to come up with a great black and white look. And again, here we have within the, the black and white effects piece of software all these different types of effects grouped for you. And we have all the, you know, so if you want a nice warm tone, come down here and click warm tone. And now it adds a nice warm tone. We're going to spend a little bit more time in black and white effects. I just thought I'd give you a little teaser there. So we'll cancel out of that. I'm going to get rid of this photograph and we're going to move on to something else here. Just to kind of drill things home, let's take this scene from the Klotz silk mill. Let's go back up the filter and jump back into detail three again. Now that you're experts because you've watched, by the way, what you're seeing there is the sticky settings. Sticky settings means all of the Topaz programs work this way. It remembers the last thing you did. So it's applying all those things we just did on that man. I'm going to, um, whoops, I hit apply. I didn't want to do that. I'm going to hit reset all. Oh, can I go back? Yeah, I just want to reset everything there. Oh, sorry about that. Let me go back in here and do this one more time. All right, let's hit reset all. Better. There we go. That's what I wanted. So here's what we have right out of the gate. Let's just go ahead and and look at some of these uh, presets just so you can see what they do. If I want to do feature enhancement, let's show you before and after. Before, after. Nice job, right? I can do light detail. Before. After, so some great presets. You can do a strong detail. It's starting to really bring out a lot of the detail in all of the image. Before, after, right? And then you even have others, which we'll talk about here in a minute. There's even some stylized things that you can do. Uh, lots to cover there. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I'm going to go back over here and reset all. And in this case, once again, we'll go down to this blur. We'll take a look at what that does. Does a really nice job of making that just insanely crisp. I'm just blown away every time I play with this. It's really good. And then we can come up here to the small details. Got to be careful. It's easy to overdo it. That's all I see that's necessary on this. The exposure and all those things are pretty good on this particular photograph. But now we can go up this effects mask. We can bring the strength, or leave the strength rather. We'll make the brush size a little bigger. Bring the flow up. Bring the edge aware way over to the right because we want it to be really good at catching the edges. And now I'm going to paint around this in this wood on this one, just again show you capabilities. And actually, I kind of like with the wood staying a little softer. For me, what it's doing is it's making the uh, 
the real subject here, which is the old notebook. That, by the way, that's a notebook that's been left behind since 1957 when the silk mill closed down. Um, and so we just kind of organized some some of the tools that have been left behind here and making a nice little still life. So let's see what we have. Very quickly, we've got a before, where you know the writing, handwriting, and the tools are not real sharp. Uh, and the after, insanely sharp and really nice job. So there you go. There, detail three is a big time winner. Um, something you'll definitely want to add into your toolkit. So now let's move along. I'll try to get in a few things because I'm sure Scott's out there and he's seeing little Abigail. He and I are both in love with our grandchildren and, and he keeps on saying, when the heck are you going to do Abigail? So I, I've got to move through some things here because if I don't get to Abigail today, Scott will uh, probably write me the first email. Okay, so let's go here. This is one that you've probably seen before, but now that we have greater control, I felt it was worth bringing up again. And let me just go to my notes. I'm going to go off the screen here for a second, guys, just for a second. Believe it or not, I do create a fair amount of notes, and so I want to make sure to stay on track with the things I want to do. Okay, so what would be a normal workflow now with, with the new detail uh, capability? Well. I would go into Topaz, and on this image I would go into Adjust. And, whoops, again it's remembering uh, the sticky settings of the last time I used it, which is a little overdone. Just by way of reminder, again, um, other webinars are out there to talk about all of the capabilities of Adjust, but the main one that we'll talk about today is, again, this relationship between adaptive exposure and regions. Adaptive exposure is like an automatic adjustment but it's applied to the whole image, and the real magic of Topaz is that it's a, it's a you know, I like to say, one to 100 adjustment rather than a one-click adjustment. So we can pull this over and have it adjust the image to different varying degrees. But when we add the region slider in, that's saying if it's all the way to the left, it's just affecting the real bright whites and the dark darks. The more we move the region slider to the right, the more it affects all of the tonalities in the image. And so in this particular image, really all I would do is bring that adaptive exposure over to the middle somewhere, bring the regions about a third of the way over, and let's give you a, a quick look at what that does. Before, after. Pretty amazing, huh? I'm going to bring that back just a little bit because it's looking a little bit too bright. By the way, just a little thought in, in processing as I kind of look at lots of images and, and workshops and so forth. The tendency is to brighten everything up. Well, in this case, if I brighten everything up like this, I'm starting to lose the magic of what drew me to the scene. What drew me to the scene was the, the, the shadow here being cast by the big windows off to the right. And as I brighten this up, it kind of takes my eye out, out of seeing this beautiful scene that's happening right in here. So be careful in your processing not to just you know, hit it with a sledgehammer. Be mindful and thoughtful as you're crafting some of these things. So I just wanted to use Topaz Adjust in this particular scene to do very minimal processing to bring out some of the detail there uh, as far as tonality detail, you know, brightness and darkness. And that's all we're going to do here, so I'm going to go ahead and accept that. And now I'm going to go into, and normally I would have uh, created a layer here. I, and again, in webinars, I tend to not do that. Uh, so we could have seen what's happening. We'll do, I'll try to remember to do that as we go through. So now let's go here to detail three. And now let's show you, remember it's going to be sticky settings, so let's reset that. Now let's come back over here to the top right. We have shadows and we have highlights. So in this particular scene, I can click on the shadows and I can now start to play with the details for just the shadow area. And I'm going to work on just the medium details and the small details. Let's do it before now. Look up in the ceiling area specifically. That's what I'm paying attention to. Hopefully you can see that. It might be a little difficult to see. Trust me, it's dramatic on my screen. There's underneath the bed here. If you look at these tiles right along this line here, let's go before, after. I mean, it's just dramatic what that's doing. And it's not affecting those highlights. It's just working on the shadows now. Really brilliant once again. But look what you can do. Notice the settings here. 
0.32 and 0.23. When I click on highlights, if I wanted to, I can just come in and work on, let's say there are just large highlights, and I can work on that. We're not doing much here. But then when I click back on shadows, it hasn't affected those two sliders. So it's not that you can just work on shadows only and then have to come back in and work on highlights at different time. You can do them both, and it's going to pay attention to both of those adjustments for you. And then once again, we can adjust exposure if we want to. And again, just to point out, look, it's very subtle. You can hardly see what's going on with my exposure slider. That's how subtle it is. It's really, really wonderful what they've done here. Contrast again, same thing. So there we go. Just two pieces of software, and we can quickly, with adjust, what we did is open up some of those tonalities a little bit, just bring a little brightness into the ceiling so it wasn't quite so dark, being careful not to overdo it. And then with the new detail, I can work just on the shadows and not affect the whole image like we used to before, giving us a ton more control, which is a big deal. Okay. Keep moving along. Although, you know, there was someone in a recent webinar said it's all great stuff that we talk about in these webinars, but it does go by pretty quickly. So a point to that. Remember, these are archives. They're taping them. And usually they'll be, as soon as it's available, I put a link on my website and make a blog post saying, here it is, so you can watch it again. Or you can go out on the Topaz's website and watch it again there. OK, let me look at my notes here. We want to just quickly, uh, because this has been an image that Topaz has used, and I realized I'd never done some processing. So I just once again want to show the, the brilliance of the black and white capability. Let's reset all. And here we are, classic black and white by hitting the first button. Pretty amazing. But what I wanted to at least do this time in the black and white module is remind you to go over here and in the con to the right side of the screen I am again. And remember that you have our good friend adaptive exposure. And so you have the ability to affect the exposure with the ex adaptive exposure and region slider just like we did in the previous image and make some very nice adjustments very quickly as I just have. And then you also have a color filter capability, which is nothing more than a piece of glass that we used to put in front of our lenses in the dinosaur days of, or the prehistoric days of film. And with that, we can bring this over and be like a green filter or be like a blue filter or like a red filter, right? And so lots of control in our black and white processing there. But even beyond that, we have color sensitivity, which now allows us to adjust each of those tonalities and have even more control. So I can bring down the blue and affect the blue sky and make it a little darker. Cyan will affect that sky as well in the different areas where the cyan in the sky. The yellow, which is in the grasses of the hay in the foreground, I can affect that and make some adjustments there on those specific, yeah, how we'll talk, specific tonalities. So lots of control in, in the, uh, the black and white effects a module, I guess I, we, we can call it. And then beyond that, you can go down and do uh, some finishing touches. You can add a border to it, albeit you know just black and white at this point. You can do some edge adjustments, some vignetting, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute on another picture. And you can even go into the silver toning and add some uh, tonal or some sepia toning or other toning should you want to. Powerful piece of software to do your black and white processing. Gotta take a look at time. It always goes by faster than I think it does. Okay. Okay, let's have some fun in this idea of crafting images. This again back to Klotz the silk mill. First thing here we'll do, and this time I'm going ahead and I'm gonna make a duplicate duplicate layer so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna go ahead and start with Topaz Adjust. And we'll start reviewing some of these things that we've been talking about. And now, though, I want, we've talked about Topaz Adjust in every single webinar because it is a great piece of, again, it's, to me, it's the core of what made Topaz worth paying attention to. And now they've just created a whole bunch of great pieces of software to go around it. So 
it's funny how you learn things. I was uh, would talking with my friend Tony Sweeten, by the way. I think he's doing a webinar coming up. Make sure to catch that. Uh, and we were just kind of reviewing the different things we're learning with uh, with all the software that we, we love to play with. And here's one I didn't understand until today. And you know, Nicole goes, well, yeah, John. <laughs> and we both learned it from Ivan, uh, who we lovingly call Ivan the Terrible, who does the web and, I'm sorry, the trade shows for the Topaz folks. You may have seen him at a show. Uh, again, just to review, I, will have, I would have used adaptive exposure and brought it over kind of halfway and then brought regions over. And that would be what I would have taught you thus far. Watch this. Here's a new idea. Bring the adaptive exposure like three quarters of the way over, making it look a little bit too much. Bring the regions over in a similar place. To me, this would have looked not very good because it's a little crunchy. But look what. Remember what's happening. And it was one of those duh moments. You're adding a whole lot of contrast with this adaptive exposure in these regions. So if we just bring the contrast down. Look what happens. So let's show you a before and after. Before, after. Hopefully you're out there going, wow, just like I was when I saw that. So let's just kind of review again and slow down and do this. So typically, and it's still a good move, bring adaptive exposure and regions over here. That's one good choice. But another choice, if we want to even open up those tonalities a little more, is to push the adaptive exposure a little further, bring the regions over a little further. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't put that to zero. And then bring the contrast way down. See, so yeah, in my mind, I'm thinking about Photoshop type things. If we bring the contrast way down, it becomes really flat, right? And so that's why I was not playing with it in that regard. And whenever Tony said, no, try this, I was like, oh, that's really, really cool. So we're going to go ahead and accept that as our new starting place to open this up a little bit. And the reason I'm going to do that, because some might be saying, but why do you want to do that, John? Because it was really cool. And, and, um, and they're right. Let me do this one more time. It is really cool to leave it where it was, because it has this great light play of dark and light, dark and light. But bear with me, and this will hopefully be a lesson in pre-visualizing your processing workflow. In this case, I'm going to go ahead back here and do what we've done, bring the contrast down, and open this up a little bit, knowing I'm going to be doing some other things as we go. All right, so let's accept that. Duplicate that layer again so we can go back and show you. Now we're going to come up and go into uh, detail again. And once again, whoop, let's do the reset all because it's applied it. I'm going to go into the shadows, and I'm going to try to open up some of the shadows a little bit with both the medium and the all the large. Let's see if we can do it before and after. It's pretty subtle. Uh, let me see where is a good place to look for you. Look at the gears. This box right down here, and even this box right up in here. Watch what happens in there. Here's before, after. See some of those details starting to come out? Subtle. Look at look down here even in the bottom left, before, after. You're starting to see those numbers show up really nicely. I can come over to the right. I'm over on the right side again. I can now look at the highlights. See if I want to play with the highlights a little bit and add some detail there. Eh, a little bit more than I want to. Go to the medium details. Okay, so now let's do before and after. We've we've worked on both the shadows and the highlights. I kind of like what that's doing. It's not being, what I really love is it's not flat at all. It's just really making those details come out. I'm going to do that. I think that's fine. I'm just looking back and forth to see if it's what I like. I'm going to come and use these exposure sliders and make sure I don't want to affect that. I think I'm going to bring that exposure down just a little bit. I might take a look at the, um, the tonal sliders here and see if there's something there that I like or not. And this is oftentimes what I do, by the way. I'm going to take a peek at now the green. We would expect to do something because all that green would work. So we can bring down that shine by pulling it down a little bit, or we can leave it shinier if that's what we want. I think I'll pull that down just a little bit with that tone slider. And there we have it as far as working with them here. I'm going to go ahead and accept that. So let's take a look here. What have we done? We've started with that. The topaz adjust. We've opened up some of those dark shadows. 
balance the exposure out a little bit with detail. We've added in some wonderful clarity, sharpness, and detail. I'm going to go ahead and duplicate my layer one more time. Come back in here and let's go into black and white effects. Now in this case, I'm just going to come down to warm tone. So the color image is this, the warm tone is that. I just love, I'm a big fan of the warm tonalities in a black and white uh, photo photograph. And then let's just introduce you to one more little adjustment, a finishing touch of a vignette. If we click that open, what we have is the, the strength of the vignette, the size, the transition of the curvature. And then if we hit the center and click on it, we can then put the center where we'd like it. And then we can start to play with the vignette strength. Too much, obviously, but actually not as too much as we thought. I really like what that's doing. And the size of that vignette, we can make that a little bit bigger there. And then the transition is kind of a, think about that as feathering the edge. And the curvature is whether it's going to be more oval or starting to be more square or rectangular. So now let's take a look. And by the way, if we want to take a look at what that particular effect was doing, we just click off on the vignette. Okay, and that, sh that little checkbox. And isn't that nice? So think back. Remember I said it's starting to look a little brighter than I wanted it to. Well, I knew I wanted to eventually convert this to black and white, and I knew I wanted to put a vignette. But I knew that if I put that vignette, leaving it all pretty dark, it would be way too dark in the final um, rendition that I was after. So by pre-visualizing ahead of time what some of the steps are that I'm going to do allows me to do some of that work in this case, all the way back in the first step within Topaz Adjust. So let's accept that. And now let's go ahead and take a look what we've been doing in a crafting, thinking about a, in this idea of crafting. And I didn't spend a lot of time because I've talked about it in other ones, and I'm guessing it's a lot of repeat people here. But the crafting idea is that you know we spend all this time crafting good images in the camera. We should spend equal amount of time being mindful and thoughtful about the crafting we're doing in post-processing, and not just hitting a button and getting a one-click look. Although that's fun and easy, it's much more fun to learn these pieces of software and craft things and be thoughtful about it. So here's our first move, the topaz adjust, brightening things up, detail, adding in the detail that we wanted, and then black and white with a vignette crafting that final look that we were after. Okay, get rid of that. All that good work, right? Being thrown away. Okay, let me look at the time. My goodness, okay, I'm going to skip. Well, no, this only takes a minute. I don't want to take the time because I said I would. So let's go here. Ooh, hang on, first thing we need to do is duplicate that background layer so we can show you what's going on. Let's go down to, what am I thinking about here, Simplify. Just a, a reminder that, again, like I said in the beginning, Simplify 4 uh, is out. Reset all to make sure nothing's there. In this case, I'm going to go to that painting preset just to show you and re really as a reminder about Simplify. And that's what it does. It gives you that buzz sim um, look, a kind of a painterly look. But remember, if you're going to use these presets as good as they are, you still have the ability to come over here roll open the global adjustments, go over to the simplify size, and instead of Nicole's preset of 0.33, you can make it whatever you feel like. And so I'm going to bring it down to more like 20 to make it a little, little more subtle. And now what I can do is hit OK. It takes a little while to process that. And then if I have it as a duplicate layer, I can turn that on and off, and you can see what the Simplify did. It made it have a nice painterly look. And just a reminder, we can add in a layer mask. If I'm in Photoshop, go down the bottom here to what I call the washing machine. It's that square with the circle. Puts in a layer mask. Here, let me hit this and get the, oops. Looks like that's off the screen a little bit, and I don't want that off the screen. Let me just pull this over. There we go. That's better. And in the, if I paint with black with a brush, it allows me to paint in that mask. And what I can do is I can get rid of 
move away from my microphone here, bring my opacity up, and I can take that buzz sim look out of the street. In this case, I would do that and leave that painterly look just on the walls of the building. So, sorry, I bumbled a little bit on that a little, little bit. So, but once again, on this layer, if you recall, I duplicated the layer first, then I did the effect in Simplify. I went down here to the bottom, clicked on a layer mask icon so that I could put a mask. I got a brush by hitting the letter B, and then I made sure to paint with black. If it's not black, these squares here, it's a whole nother lesson. I don't want to spend the time, but paint with the color black in that mask. And then I can remove that effect just in the area that where I want to. And so now I've created this painterly look in this great San Miguel scene with Simplify. OK. In case, I mean, I, again, Scott's mean and he can be, you know, trouble. So I'm going to go ahead and open these two images. And we're going to just, because in a previous, you know, probably two webinars ago, we talked about, somebody had asked about remask, and I said, you know, I just don't do that type of work very much. Eh, why did that not oh, no, oh, good. And so I promised that I would uh, do this next time. So what, all I'm going to do is I'm going to get the move tool, and I'm going to bring Abigail and drag her on top of this particular poppy field in Tuscany. And let me just make that a little kind of a main screen here. Okay, so I have my background layer over on the right side. I have Abigail sitting on her own layer. I'm going to go into filter, topaz, and remask. And again, I'm painting with a uh, with a mouse here, so you're just going to have to bear with me. This is not going to be perfection, but you're going to get the idea. Okay, it automatically defaults in giving us, you're going to see, normally you don't see this red band, but because they're different sized images, uh, you're seeing this red band here. Normally it would be all green, and that's what it defaults to. And it gives you a blue, notice my brush here has a blue uh, circle around it. That's because it is a blue brush, and these brushes can be gotten here. Remember, in Remask, the way it works is the green is what it's going to keep, the red is what's going to throw out, and the blue is the computation uh, area. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to start liberally painting around Abigail of what I want to keep. And I'm not going to keep her tootsies. I know you might be upset with me for not keeping her tootsies. I think her mother would like her to have her tootsies. And that's all I need to do. And then what I'm going to do is go grab my fill tool, and I'm going to grab the red bucket tool and click in here because I want to throw that away and I want to keep Abigail. And now if I hit my compute mask, if I've done everything correctly, there we go. And up here we have the ability to see the, the original image. I'm up at the top left. The tri map that we just created, the mask that we just created, and there's what we're going to keep and there's what we're going to cut out. So those are we can see. Now, it, it's probably not perfect yet. So I'm going to make her a little bigger, and we can see that we have some issues here around her. We can see some little artifacts left behind. Well, not a big deal. Go back and grab your red basic brush. I'm over here on the left side again. And all I'm going to do is click, and it's going to go through and recompute in those areas and start to get rid of those little left behind pieces. And again, in the, because of the time here, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. If I hit the H key, I can grab, that gives me my hand, and I can now move this around. Another good thing to do is if you go up here, you can do a split screen, and you can start to see both of these if you wanted to. Another tool to help you do the fine tuning and the masking there. But I can get the hand tool, go back and grab that red brush, start going in closer here. And you know it's each time I go where I don't want that, it's going to... Uh, fine-tune the mask. Okay, that's all I'm going to do for this in the, because of time that we have. I'm going to get hit OK. And now if I click off on the middle layer, there we have Abigail sitting out in the pile of flowers. and She's been transported all the way to Tuscany, which is great. So, okay, we've, I'm exhausted. <laughs> we've covered a lot here um, as we normally do. But hopefully you'll you see that there's power in a lot of the different tools that Topaz has to offer. Today we really just covered what? Topaz Adjust, 
the new detail, simplify briefly, black and white, and remask. So in this great holiday season that we're in, you know, people often ask me, what do I get? Well, you know, topaz are just as great as what I say. And then I say, gosh, I couldn't live without having black and white effects because I really like that. And then the new detail is just killer. And you start to put those together, and you've spent enough money to buy the, the, the whole bundle. And Nicole's going to have a 30% discount coming up for the whole bundle, which you can only get by sticking around for a webinar. And I appreciate you doing that. So my recommendation is always making sure that you're, and she's going to give the coupon code here in a minute as to what it is. Um, but I would recommend the whole bundle because, as you saw today, there's, what, five plugins that make sense, and those will be more than what the cost of the bundle. Remember also that it's free upgrades. Uh, at least that's the, the, the model that they have for now, and it's been that way ever since I've had a relationship with, with Topaz. And so it's a great deal. And by the way, if you have other of their, if you already have a just and detail in black and white and you want to upgrade to the whole bundle, there's an upgrade path for that as well. So I'm done talking. Um, I'm sure there might be one or two questions or some snarky comments from Brian, so I'm ready. <laughs> All right, thanks, Nicole? John. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank Scott. you so much. I, I haven't seen any yet, but you never know. We do have a lot of questions, though. No snarky comments? I don't I may have missed them though. I was uh <laughs> typing away for some of them. <laughs> All right. A couple of questions coming at you really quickly. Um Kay had asked at the beginning, especially with your uh gentleman, are most of these shot with natural light or are you using any sort of lighting? Uh you know, <laughs> that's an easy answer. I'm horrible with lights. <laughs> I, I'm getting pretty good, I think, with natural lighting, but no, I, I tend to shoot uh, mostly with natural light. I help my wife, who has a, a keen desire to do some, what I would call people photography, portrait type of work. So I'm learning about lights, but in all of these photographs here, no, I have, there's no artificial light employed. They're all natural light. Okay, great. Um, and Sergey had asked, uh, when you were working on a couple of the images, if they were a RAW or JPEG image? Yeah, good question. I just realized I told a lie. I need to retract that last comment. I'm looking right at Abigail. Obviously, the shot of Abigail was done with strobe lights in our basement. So oh. <laughs> with the exception of Abigail, and so if you're laughing at how bad the strobe quality is on that, it's because, again, I don't know what I'm doing with that quite yet. So, okay, the next question is, in this case, because it's a webinar and I want the processing to happen quickly, you can look right here on my screen. You'll see that there's PSDs and JPEGs. The bottom line is I use a very small file, just so a 72 DPI file, so they'll move along pretty quickly. In my own personal workflow, I always, 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 always shoot raw, period. And there is no other way to go in my mind. I don't want to lose all of that data. So I'm, I'm shooting in the raw, as we say. <laughs> and uh, converting to JPEGs only when I want to post something for my blog uh, or use in a webinar or something like that. All right, thanks. JPEGs uh, today, though. Yes. Christopher had asked if you do any processing in Adobe Camera Raw before opening in Photoshop and then using Topaz, but I'm guessing because you're using RAW, you do some, so. Yeah, absolutely, you bet. Uh, more so than ever, the, the new RAW engine in Lightroom and Photoshop, which obviously are the same in Photoshop 6, it's the same engine, uh, is dramatically different. You know, much like this new detail is dramatically different, uh, so is the RAW processing capability in Photoshop. So it's put it this way. I'm, and I'm dead serious with this, and I have no relationship whatsoever with Adobe like I do with, with Topaz. It's absolutely worth the price of admission. If you don't have version 6, it's worth it just for the raw conversion capability. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions? We're having a lot of people comment on your voice today. Very nice voice, uh -oh. John. <laughs> uh, that's really funny because we were just talking about that before the webinar. You guys think it's good now. You should hear me in the morning. <laughs> really <good. laughs> All right. Let's see. I have a couple people asking you, what kind of sharpening do you use Opaz Detail 3? I've kind of been going more towards creative sharpening and then output as well. But some people are asking if you use it as a capture sharpener. You know, I haven't. I, I tend to, to do 
no, my normal sharpening to date, and it really is starting to change a little bit with detail, it really honestly is, um, has been to use Smart Sharpen in Photoshop. So the, the capture sharpening might be a little bit of subtle sharpening within the raw module in Raw Converter in Photoshop. And then do my work and then I would use detail in certain situations but again I didn't use it as much as I will now because it was a little heavy-handed and didn't give me the control and I was too lazy to make layer masks on my own and all that uh, but now it's absolutely going to be part of my workflow because it's really that good and it's much more subtle so I would do the capture sharpening as a lot of people tend to do in the raw side of the world and add that little bit of uh, image capture sharpening do your workflow Take a look at Detail 3 almost all the time at this point, and, and whether it's a people-type shot where we saw how good the de-blur worked. And, and quite honestly, I was showing the other capabilities on that picture of the Cuban man. All I would have done is the de-blur, period, and nothing else. I wouldn't have added in any more because that's all it needed, and then I would have been done at that point. It would have been you know, final sharpening for that particular size JPEG that I was working on at that moment. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I have been asking about when you would suggest using your host program adjustments, such as Lightroom uh, adjustments versus Topaz adjustments, if there's kind of the similar adjustments within each program. Yeah, and that's a really good question. And, and you know, the answer to me it gets down to a similar answer that you've probably heard before from others or myself, and that is it really comes down to personal choice and personal preference. It really does. I know some great photographers. Graham's a good friend of mine and, and he's in this mode right now where he doesn't want to use, and you don't want to hear this, close your ears, Nicole, but he doesn't want to use any plugins right now. <laughs> he wants to create all the, and he's doing a great job, but it's a lot of work. I mean, he, he's doing it all within Lightroom and, and that's about it. I'm completely the opposite. I'm a plug-in junkie. <laughs> I really am. Because I just feel like, yes, can you do all of the things that we're doing here in Topaz with just Photoshop? Yeah, uh, arguably you can. But the learning curve to do that is enormous, years. I mean, I think I know a fair amount about this stuff, but you know, that's because I have some time to do it. But most of you folks, I hope, have day jobs. <laughs> and you don't have the time that I do to play. So the plugins just make life a lot easier. So if you're happy doing a lot of your color, you know, Photoshop and Lightroom are great for color enhancements. I'll be very candid on that. I tend to use Photoshop for all my color adjustments. I'm not going to do it in, in uh, Topaz typically. I'm not going to work on saturation in Topaz. It's just not, I, I like the control that I tend to have in Photoshop or in Lightroom for that. Uh, so I guess trying to answer the person's question, I'm going to be doing all of the adjustments, and I'm not a Lightroom guy yet, I'm working on it because so many of my students in the workshops have it, I feel like I need to finally. And I'm just a creature of habit using Bridge, my old folder system, and then using Photoshop, and then using plugins in Photoshop. So, uh, you know, use your workflow that you're comfortable with, do all that you can in Photoshop or in Lightroom, and then use the Topaz tools to further craft your vision into something that you you want and uh, so I just you know people wince about certain things oh, why do you use that or I don't you know I hate plugins or whatever I, I think that's craziness it, they're just another tool to allow you to create a vision that you have about your work that's all it is thank you yes um, yeah. I agree so let's see here we have a couple people along the way who have asked if you are a denoise user and if you uh, denoise your images um, at the beginning of your workflow yeah that's a good question um, so here's the, the issue there there really is noise in every single image you have even if you've got the latest sensor and it's a perfect capture. The reality is, without being too technical about it, noise lives in all of your images, period. So if you have, though, a more particularly noisy issue, <laughs> image, uh, you know, kind of like this top right one here uh, in this great little storage room at the cloth silk mill with the shoes and all that stuff, then there's likely going to be a lot more noise because of those dark areas it would make a lot of sense to do a very low level noise reduction with a denoise type of product first then do your enhancements because 
as you do, and we did, if you remember, we did a fair amount of work in Topaz Adjust on that to brighten some of those areas up, well, you're going to enhance that noise really quickly. Anytime you're doing contrast adjustments, whether it's adjust, which is essentially a contrast adjustment, or using a contrast slider, you're going to make the noise that's there really evident. So by doing a, a, a and, it's, and I'm talking about doing a noise reduction that's almost imperceptible to you. You don't want to really see that level of noise reduction when you're doing it. You're just doing a really low level. Then you can go do your workflow, and at that point, if there, you're not going to be enhancing that noise because you've taken care of it on the front end. And then if you really are pushing some sliders around and you still see some noise, you may, you're probably going to have to go back to denoise again and just address those areas. Um, by the way, just a little thought on that. What I would tend to do is I duplicate my layer, use denoise again. This is at the end now if we've pushed it too far, not, not the capture type of noise reduction, but more of at the end. Because sometimes you're going to soften it out too much in the areas that you don't want to soften that, that really are not overtly noisy. And so I would use a layer, layer mask, do the denoise, now go back in and just paint that noise reduction into those dark areas uh, that way. And so be, again, be mindful, thoughtful, and not just hit it with a hammer, but let's, let's do the work in the part of the image that needs it. All right. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate you being here again. And a lot of people are very excited about what you've shown them. So Good. thank you. Well, Topaz rocks. I mean, the company's great. The service is great. I mean, I can't say enough. And I and you know, Nicole mentioned early on that we have a really. It's true. I've I've been associated with Topaz way back when they were a tiny little company and just starting up, and we forged a relationship that's been a good one. So yes, I'm a little partial to their products, <laughs> but I wouldn't be talking about them if I didn't believe in them and actually use them in my workflow. So, treat yourself to a Christmas present. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you again, John. I really appreciate you coming back. And You're welcome, and happy holidays to everybody. Be safe, please. About to say the same. Happy holidays to you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye now.